Good morning, church. Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate that. <clears throat> so how is everybody doing the first day of the new year? Good. Uh, you know, we're in 2022. <laughs> I never thought that I'm going to say those words. Uh, back in like, you know, 2000, they were thinking it's the world is ending, you know, then in 2010, the world was ending. Remember, then 2012, the world was ending, and we're now in 2022. So, but we praise God for all his goodness and mercy, amen? So I'm going to switch that to the screen. You can see that? Yes. All right. Well, once again, Happy New Year to you, and, and uh, I hope as many people have expressed that thought that it's going to be a better year than we had in 2021, right? We all hope for that. We all hope for that. And not just what's going on in the world, but for our own personal lives, our own personal experience. So I entitled my sermon this morning, The Remedy for a Divided Heart. <clears throat> Most of you, I don't know if you stayed up late last night until 12. No, everybody's saying no. Usually people stay up and at the stroke of midnight last night, we have crossed the dividing line between the old and the new year, right? You see the 2022 is pushing the 2021 away. Right at 12 o'clock is the dividing line, the division between the old and the new year. And many people find this experience very exciting. Um, that is why they stay up late, as I said, until 12 o'clock and, and wait until the countdown and then, then they ring in the new year. Done it many times. I don't know, the older you get, the less you want to stay up. I, I'm very honest with that. <laughs> uh, it kind of loses that, you know, that fun and enthusiasm. But people still do that and they usually ring in the new year with a what? With a party, getting people together and, and fellowshipping together and, and having fun together. And so we celebrate the division between the old and the new year. We celebrate the achievements and the accomplishments of the past year and look forward with great anticipation to the accomplishments, to even greater accomplishments in the new year. So, but unlike this division between the old and the new year that we all celebrate, there are some other divisions that are not to be celebrated. If you follow the political and uh, you know, the social developments in the last two years, the word division has been very popular, all right? Uh, divisive, division, dividing. You can hear an all lot of, you know, in the media and the news everywhere, this world, this word. Um, we are divided these days pretty much on everything. We are divided based on race, ethnicity, politics, religion, sexual orientation, gender, climate, etc., etc., etc. Everybody is divided on something these days. We experience higher than ever antagonism between different groups of people. Have you seen that? It's, it's such a high antagonism, like people almost hate each other. If you belong to this group, you can't even have a conversation with the people from this group anymore because we don't know how to get along anymore. It seems everything that is being done is with the purpose to divide us. Now, The Guardian magazine um, put an, an article last year, and they said these, thing, the, these words, the, the dividing line between so-called normality and madness is thinner than we think. Have you experienced that lately? <laughs> I don't think that there is any line existing anymore, okay? Not even a thin one. There is no normality anymore. The, the madness and normality, they are amalgamated, okay? Everything, it seems like it's all madness, nonsense. Nothing makes sense anymore in this world. There is no dividing line between normality and madness anymore. They say it's getting thinner, but I think we all know that it's non-existent today. Now, the Time magazine, um, the cover from November 2020, remember what happened in November 2020? It was that big election in the United States, remember that? Uh, a crazy one. You've never seen that, that much division in your lifetime among people from the same country, uh, from the same family, you know? And so in November of 20, uh, 2020, when the pandemic was going on and the election was going on in the United States, um, they had this cover that shows 
the bitter divisions in America. The cover shows half of a nation's torn American flag, but it's made as a mask. You see that? And it's torn in half because people were divided by politics and by this pandemic. All right, and we st still see a lot of division based on the pandemic, how people view the pandemic. So America is really divided. Um, it represents this nation that is torn apart by political and cultural polarization. But this is not just the story of America. This is the story of the entire world today, isn't it? The same is happening in Canada and all around the world. So the question that I have today is this, why is the world so divided? Why is America divided? Why is Canada divided? Why is the entire world so divided? Well, if you read a lot of these newspaper articles and look in media, all of them have their biased answers, all right? They will come from their own point of view, based on their own uh, views and so on and so forth. But in order to find the true answer, the true reason why we as a society, as people so divided, we need to go to the Word of God to find out the answer why we're so divided. Well, to begin with, this is devil's strategy, isn't it? His strategy is always to divide and conquer. That's what he does. Uh, he has been doing this from the beginning. The more divided we are as a nation, as a church, as a family, as a society, the easier for him is to defeat us. We become an easy target to Satan. That's why that is his strategy. So he employs this strategy, this tactic, very, very well today. Satan is the master of deception and division. Jesus is talking in John chapter 10 and verse 10, but prior to that, in John chapter 10, Jesus is talking about himself as being the good shepherd. Then he compares himself to the bad shepherds, and he calls those bad shepherds thieves, okay? And this is what he tells is the purpose of the thieves when they come. And he says in John 10 verse 10, the thief does not come except to what? to steal and to kill and to what? And to destroy. You know, in the immediate context of John chapter 10, uh, the thief here refers to false prophets and false teachers and leaders of Jewish nations who rob people of truth and eventually rob them of salvation. That's who they are in the immediate context of John chapter 10. But we all know even though in the immediate context this refers to human beings, in the bigger picture, this refers to whom? To the devil. He is the master thief. He's the one who comes to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he's been doing that from the beginning. Now, the easiest way for a predator to steal a sheep, you know how, what's the easiest way to do it? To isolate that sheep to isolate it from the flock, to divide the sheep from the flock, and then the predator attacks when that sheep is on its own. All right? That's the easiest way to do it. Divide it, separate it, isolate that person from the flock, and then attack. Because when you're by yourself, you're much weaker than when you're together with your brothers and sisters. We become an easy prey to Satan when we are isolated from the rest of the flock. And that is why Satan first uses everything in his power to divide us and separate us. And then when he has accomplished that, he delivers the killer blow and destroys us. We're in a great danger when we are on our own. Remember uh, the parable of a hundred sheep when Jesus told the lost sheep there were a hundred sheep and the, the shepherd, uh, one sheep was lost. So when the shepherd comes and all the 99 are together, what does he do? He leaves them and goes to look for one. Why? Because he knew those 99 are together. They're much safer together. But that one that is on its own is in great danger. That's why he leaves all of the 99 behind and goes and looks for the one that was isolated, was lost. We're in great danger today when we are on our own. And Satan is doing everything possible to bring division even in the church. And he's doing it very successfully. Now, 
Let's bring this closer a little bit to us. The pandemic made us very vulnerable to Satan's attacks because we have been isolated from the rest of the flock. Now, I'm not saying that you know, it happened because of different circumstances, but it did happen. The word isolation was on the mouth of every politician and doctor right from the beginning, and we're still going through isolation, even though Omicron, which is threatening the society today, is just a simple cold. Go figure that. I wasn't supposed to say that, probably, <laughs> but I did it because I feel frustrated. I feel very frustrated with this stuff. But Satan is behind this. Satan is really behind this. He's trying to destroy the church and he's trying to destroy you as individual Christians. How he does that, how he accomplished that is by separating us and dividing us and keeping us isolated from the rest of the flock. Now, even though most of you tell me that you are connected to the church via, via live stream. And it's great to have live stream. I love live stream. It, it, it offers a lot of opportunities for those people who can be here. And people, when I tell people, I haven't seen you in church for two years now. Oh, pastor, we see you on the screen every Sabbath. You're a star to us. <laughs> You're on TV. We see you on TV every Sabbath. And I'm, you know, I, you know I'm, okay, I, you know, you see me on TV. A live stream is good, but let me tell you this, it's nothing in comparing to that personal connection that you have when you come here. Amen. It's nothing. Let me tell you that. Uh, I was watching, I was on vacation last week and I watched from home last Sabbath. It's not the same. It's not the same as being here in the church. And I know I said that during Sabbath school, I know a lot of you are still scared about this pandemic, and we're not forcing anybody to, to, to come here. But I want you to make this intentional effort to start connecting back with the church. It's been far too long for some of you that are watching from home. Some of you I haven't seen for two years now. You know what the devil is doing? He has isolated you completely. He has divided you, isolated you from the flock and keeps you isolated. Nothing can replace the personal connection. Nothing can replace that. If I don't go to church for a week or two, I miss it. I don't know what about you, but I do. It's not just because of the sermons and the singing. It's just that fellowship, that connection aspect that we have with people around us. We need that. Even for our mental health, well-being, we need that. You know, we talk a lot about this pandemic, but nobody talks about mental health and what that is doing to people today. Suicide in teenagers and young kids. We need each other. We need the fellowship. It is much easier for Satan to steal you away and destroy you when you're on your own. That is why belonging to a group of believers and fellowshipping together is so important for our spiritual experience. If you look in the book of Acts, everything they did was meeting together pretty much every day. They, it says that they were meeting every day in the homes and on Sabbath they were going to the synagogue, to the temples. Because that's the most important aspect of Christian existence, experience. And if the pandemic took that away from us. So please, I'm appealing to those who are watching live online today, make sure that you try to connect to someone. Even if you don't come here, connect to a smaller group of people somehow. Make that an effort in 2021 to reconnect with people in the church, to, to not be isolated because Satan is trying to steal you away. The Bible tells us that the problem of division is, is with, within each person. It's within us, okay? We can put the problem many different things today on, on race or gender or anything else or politics, but it starts where? 
in our own hearts. That's why I entitled my sermon today, uh, The Remedy for a Divided Heart. I want you to go back to Hosea, to our scripture reading today. Hosea chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. We're going to look at the core problem with, with this division. All right? So Hosea 10, verse 1 and 2. Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for whom? For himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have established his sacred pillars. Their hearts are what? Their heart is what? Is divided. Now they're held guilty. He will break down their altars, meaning God will break down their altars. God will ruin their sacred pillars. In verse 1, we see Israel is compared to a vine, but instead of serving others with its fruit, Israel is what? It's selfish, isn't it? It says that they're doing it, uh, bearing fruit for whom? For himself. They're selfish. Uh, that selfish attitude led Israel to increase the altars. Altars are a place to bring sacrifices. So this refers to the idolatrous lifestyle of Israel at that time. Now, selfishness is a form of idolatry, isn't it? Why? Because selfishness, it leads us to worship ourselves instead of worshiping God. So Israel, when they became selfish, they became idolatrous. They, because they focused on themselves instead of focusing on God, they focused on serving themselves instead of focusing God. Now, <clears throat> you know, our society today is very self-oriented, isn't it? It's everything about me, 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 what is good for me. And that's, that's with a purpose. Satan has a purpose for that. Once you're focused on yourself, you are not serving God anymore. And we are getting to the same problem that Israel had. And this is what God responds in verse 2 to Israel's selfishness. To their, uh, and he says that, um, they tell, he tells the Israelites that the root problem with that is that they have a divided heart. The selfish behavior that they are exhibiting here is because of their divided heart. He says here that they want to serve God, but at the same time, they build altars and serve other gods as well. And God pronounces what? He pronounces a verdict here, and he says that they are guilty. Very strong words, aren't they? Israel is guilty of having a divided heart which leads to idolatry. So now my question to you today is this. How many of us are guilty of having a divided heart. Think about your own heart, about your own life. Are you guilty of having a divided heart? How many of us fall into modern day idolatry where we place everything else above God? How many of us are guilty of trying to serve God and the world at the same time? The problem of Christians today is that they forgot who they really serve. They forgot who they serve. Uh, during the administration of the President Lyndon Johnson um, in 1900s, you remember the beginning of 1900s was the Great Depression and uh, big economic crisis and so on and so forth. And there was um, a, man by, a man by the name John Gal Galbraith. And uh, he was a very noted economist in the early 1900s, and everybody was seeking his advice, many dignitaries, the presidents, uh, to, to see how they can revive the economy, and so on and so forth. And so one day, this man, John uh, Galbraith, he, um, he was very tired, and he asked his uh, housekeeper, Emily, her name was Emily, to just hold on of all the telephone calls, all right, while he was taking a nap. And so shortly thereafter, he went to sleep. The phone rings, and guess who was on the phone? The President of the United States himself, Lyndon Johnson. And he's like, please, I need to talk to, to John. And uh, Emily replied, well, I'm sorry, he's sleeping, Mr. President. Well, uh, but you know who's talking to you. I'm the President. I really need to talk to him. Well, sir, he told me not to disturb him, but I need to talk to him. Well, um, he said, well, Mr. President, she said, 
I want to tell you that I am serving him and not you. I don't know how many people tell it to a president. You know, Emily, the housekeeper, understood an important truth. She was a servant to one man and obeyed his wishes only. One man alone. No matter who is calling, the president himself, she was serving this man, not the president. Her loyalties were to Mr. Mr. Galbraith alone. And what a great example of a true servant. And the question is to you today, who are you loyal to? Do you have a divided heart? Do you have divided loyalties these days? Are you loyal to God and to the world? Where your loyalties lie? Now, Charles Spurgeon um, preached a sermon on the divided heart on Hosea 10, verse 2, and he said the following words. A divided heart is a fearful disease that is difficult to cure. It is not an acute disease which brings pain and suffering and sorrow with it, but it is what? It's chronic. This is a disease which enters the very nature of every human being. This is a disease, in fact, which nothing but, but the um, uh, omnipotent grace can ever overcome. It's a chronic disease. And it enters into your bloodstream, into the very nature of who you are, and you become this double, you know, um, divided-hearted person. Now, how many of you read this book before? <laughs> The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Anybody read this book before? Some of you had to read it in school, probably. Um, the author is uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. This is one of his famous books. I read it while I was at CEC. I took a literature class, and we had to read this book. If you didn't, it's, it's a good read. Uh, it's, a, it's a very strange book, but it's good <laughs> at the same time. Now, what happens in this, in this story, um, the author, it shows a problem that is very common, uh, common to humanity. The hero was the Dr. Jackal, and he was a distinguished man of science. The, word, the world saw him as a brilliant and benevolent, you know, but uh, deep inside, however, in his hu nature, there was another different personality which was evil and cruel and sensual, devoted to everything evil. And the story is about a potion that Dr. Jekyll invented, and when he would drink the potion, he would become that other personality, which was, he called Mr. Hyde. So it's this dual personality almost, this divided allegiance, okay? And, uh, he, and so he had two personalities, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And the only way to call that second personality was to drink that magic potion that he devised. Now, one day, however, he discovered that he had changed to Mr. Hyde without using the potion. You see the lesson here? The evil has become dominant and had begun to, begun to control his life. It became his nature. It went deep down into his bloodstream and in everything, it became his nature. That's what evil does. That's what Satan does. All of us have felt that divided heart at one point in our lives. Two voices inside you have often been contradictory. That bad side of us, the Mr. Hyde, that part takes different forms with different people. And the unfortunate reality for all of us today as Christians is that we believe, many of us believe, that we can control Mr. Hyde in us. You say, well, I can be with God, but I can be with the world as well. And you know what? I can control the world, the, that was worldly desires, and I can call them up only when I want them. You think you can control that? You think you can control Mr. Hyde? You can't. Evil will overtake, and it will become your nature. That's what, you know, 
Unfortunately, at one point, without even us realizing that, Mr. Hyde takes over. And Paul wrote about this problem of a divided heart long before Robert Louis Stevenson. In Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, he tells us how the new man and the old man are always opposite to one another. Then he ex expounds on that in Romans chapter 7, where he talks about that flesh and the spirit always fighting. Paul wrote a lot about it. Now, this verse is very, and I'm going to read this from a New Living Translation, Galatians 5, verse 17. This is what Paul talks about, these two natures always fighting within ourselves. The sinful nature, which is Mr. Hyde, wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good, what? Intentions. I like the way New Living Translation puts it. Now, you might say this, Pastor, I always have good intentions. This is the same what Paul says in Romans 7. I have good intentions. I want to do good. But he finds himself doing what? Doing the evil that he doesn't want to do. And a lot of bad things always happen because of good intentions. But because those two forces always fight within us, we are not able to carry out those good intentions. And so God wants us to get rid of that divided heart. He wants us to find a treatment and a remedy for the divided heart. Ellen White says this in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 234. Why the Christian life is so difficult to many is that they have a divided heart. Do you think your Christian life is difficult? That's the problem. Because you have a divided heart. Listen to what she says. They are double-minded, which makes them what? Unstable in all their ways. What have you been doing faithfully, she's asking. Hard work in the business and cares of this life? That doesn't count, she says. Will this bring from the lips of Christ the gracious words, oh, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I don't think so. I don't think so. As you can see, the problem with the divided heart that Ellen White is pointing out here is that it makes us unstable in our lives. A divided heart leads to an inconsistent and superficial spiritual experience. That's what's the problem with the undivided heart, with the divided heart. We are unstable. We are inconsistent. We are superficial. So what is the remedy for a divided heart? I was reading this article by Harold Saylor, and he provides these three simple remedies. I'm going to just give them to you so you can see them on the screen as well. This is what he says. The first remedy, make a commitment. And what he means by that, he says, run up your flag and decide whom you intend to serve. I like this. You know why? This is like Joshua did. Remember in Joshua 24, verse 15, when he's telling the Israelites that you can do whatever you want, but me and my family, we will what? Serve the Lord. That was a public commitment to serve the Lord. This person here says, put up your flag and be proud of serving the Lord, right? A lot of us want to serve the Lord in the privacy of our homes and hiding so nobody knows that you are serving God. You know, used to be in America, not anymore, and that they're, they're very patriotic, right? And all the big flags in every yard. If you go to the south, they still do that. In the north and the west here, they don't do that. They're not patriotic anymore in America. But big flags, because they're putting up the flag, they want to publicly show that they love this country, and they're, you know, proud of it. <clears throat> it seems that these days, as I said even in Sabbath school, many Christians want to serve God in secret. In other words, they don't want to raise their flag so to show their allegiance to God. Uh, after all, it is not very popular these days to show allegiance towards God and religion, so you want to do it in secret so nobody can see you. Uh, we must raise the banner high. Amen. We must raise the banner high. We must, <clears throat> as Apostle Paul says, we must not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? If you're a Christian and you serve God, make a commitment and show that commitment publicly. 
be on God's side publicly, raise up the flag, raise up the banner high. The second remedy <clears throat> that this person says is to close the door on what divides your loyalty. Listen, uh, <clears throat> this is a very interesting one. <clears throat> Once you made a commitment, then close the door on what divides your loyalty. Uh, leaving the door open to gratify your flesh will lead to a failure. Uh, close the door on the past so there is but one direction to go. Now the problem that we always want to, we always want to hold on to the flesh, to the desires of the flesh. We want to serve God but say, well maybe just a little thing in my life, I still want it. I, I'm going to hold on to it. And so we don't close the door to our desires of the flesh completely. And... Uh, and sometimes those desires of the flesh can bring us pain and hurt, but even though they bring pain and hurt, we still like the flesh and we, want, we don't want to let it go. I read this illustration about a man, he went to, uh, to the doctor, he had a, his tooth was hurting really badly. So he went to the doctor and he asked, the, um, the dentist told him, just try to relax, I'll pull your aching tooth in five minutes, he says. It'll, it will be five, done in five minutes. And the patient said, how much will it cost me? Of course, you want to know. And the dentist says, well, it will cost you $100. And the guy said, that much for just five minutes of work? <laughs> well, the dentist replied, well, if you prefer, I can pull it out very slowly for you. You know, there is, a, there is a lesson in this humorous illustration. Many of us, like, like this person who has an aching tooth, we want it pulled out, but very slowly. We still want to hold on to it, to something. Even though it hurts us and it pains, we still want to hold on. I believe that we need to deal decisively with the sin problem in our life. Amen? It has to be decisive. It is because otherwise we cannot close the door to, uh, to the divided hearts. I believe that it's time to decide if we truly want an undivided heart and then take decisive step to just close the door to the flesh and its desires. So that's remedy number two, close the door and do it decisively. You know when you go to the door and you're selling something and people don't want to buy it, what do they do? They slam the door right in your face. <laughs> You've, I've experienced that many times when you go with books from the church or, you know, inviting them to the church. They're very decisive, right? Well, not, we, we need to be the same way, decisive to the bad things. Close the door decisively, leave it behind, and move on. Let's go to remedy number three. This is what this person says. Remedy number three. Once you've made a decisive commitment and you put up the flag to show everyone that you're committed to Christ and serving Him, once you have closed the door to the flesh, then you must get involved into, in the Lord's cause. That's very, very important. You can make a commitment. You can even put up the flag that you serve God. You can even close the door. But if you don't start getting involved, what's going to happen after a while? The desires of the flesh will come knocking back on your door. And eventually, you are going to open up the door to those desires of the flesh. Remember what Jesus said when he cleanses from a demon, from an evil spirit? He says, you must... Because there is an emptiness there, if you don't fill it up with good things, what happens? Seven more will come, bad demons, you know, the demons will come and fill that space. You must fill that space. Once you have closed the door and you made the commitment, you must get involved in the cause of God. So, in conclusion, <clears throat> going back to this book, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Do you know the last sentence? This is how the book ends, very tragically. This is how it ends. Doctor, uh, the, the author writes this, I bring the life of that unhappy Dr. Jekyll to an end. Isn't this tragic? Remember, Mr. The Dr. Jekyll was the good nature, the personality. Mr. Hyde was the bad one. Once uh, Mr. Hyde took over that bad personality, what happens? 
the life of Dr. Jekyll comes to an end. You know, this is a very depressing and tragic end because evil triumphed here. But if you look in the book, in the Bible, who triumphs at the end? <laughs> it's God. It's Jesus. Amen? It's not evil. This is a praise God that we can look forward to a different end. Uh, Paul was able to say in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the end. Good triumphs at the end. Even though we have that struggle within us right now, but good will triumph. What Jesus did for Paul, giving him victory over his flesh, he can do that for you as well. Because God has no magic potion like Dr. Jekyll. He has grace. Amen? That's what God has. And when sin, where sin abounds, says Paul in Romans 5.20, grace abounded what? Much more. From the very beginning, men and women have struggled with the issue of a divided heart. And Robert Roberts, Robinson, uh, you probably don't know him, but he's the author of the song, that, the closing song that we're going to sing today, which is, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. Uh, Robert Robinson knew this battle that often is fought over this divided heart. He knew what's going on within, us, in, within each person, that we have this almost split personality. We have divided allegiances. And one of his hymns that was written in 1758, Count and Found of Every Blessing, reflects that struggle and that we often feel today. And he wrote this, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. We are prone, to, we, we love God, but we are prone to do what? To leave him. Because it's this struggle within ourselves. We have this divided heart. Even though we love God, we still want to be with the world, and we are always leaving God. And it's, he's the one that we love, but we leave him. And you know what? If this would be the end of the song, it would be depressing. It would be like the, the story with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It would be a bad end. But the writer of this song, he follows with the following words, which bring us hope. And I hope that these words will become our commitment to God as we enter this new year in 2022. And this is what he says. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Even though we're prone to wonder, we're prone to leave the God we love, we can make this decisive commitment today. Will you make that commitment today? Say, Lord, here's my heart. Please take it. It's yours. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. May God bless you in this new year. May he give us an undivided heart. And may we serve him faithfully and be loyal only to him. Amen.